Thank you, members. We'll move to questions without notice, and I'll call the Leader of the Opposition, Ms Lee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, on the 9th of July, a detainee escaped custody in broad daylight within a few hundred metres of schools and playgrounds after the Toyota Camry he was travelling in was intentionally and repeatedly rammed. The Inspector of Correctional Services had months ago found the Camry unsuitable for escort purposes. Moreover, Court Transport Unit, or CTU, officers described it as, quote, unfit for purpose, end quote, and had stopped using it. You have now halted the use of the Camry despite initially defending it. Minister, how did we get to the point where this detainee was able to escape? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Lee for the question. First of all, let me commend the bravery of the corrections officers who were involved in the incident of the day. I have met with them uh, personally and the uh, uh, foresight, courage and skill uh, that they put forward during that incident uh, should be well uh, commended. Our staff do a brilliant job uh, and a very difficult job as well, and I thank them for the work that they do do, especially when something like this happens. Of course, the matter is subject to a police investigation as well as being before the courts. ACT Corrections is undertaking an internal review and it has been referred to the Inspector of Correctional Services as a critical incident. And when these investigations are concluded, I'll be able to make a further statement as to what occurred. Ms Lee, supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why did it take a brazen daytime assault on corrections staff in a busy Canberra suburban street to finally convince you to stop using Camrys in line with the inspector's finding back in November 2020. Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam. I should point out, of course, that the um, inspector's uh, research was particularly on the court transport unit, not on the Camrys used for transport to hospital. Uh, so it was after the event and the discussion with the commissioner uh, that uh, I gave the advice to cease using uh, the Camrys unless it's exceptional circumstances uh, and of course that's a procedure put in place. Mr Hanson. Minister, given that the detainee was able to sprint from the crime scene, why was he not adequately restrained and are you now reviewing the risk assessment procedures for escorts? Mr Gentleman. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, we are reviewing uh, of course the operation uh, of that particular escort. Uh, he was restrained, I understand, by custodial officers, uh, and the rest of that will be uh, matters for the ins uh, Corrections Inspectorate and ACT Policing. Mrs Jones, you have a supplementary? No, you have, I have a, a question. question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, to the Minister for Corrections, as we know in July, as mentioned, a detainee was able to escape from custody. The Camry he was being transported in had been declared unsuitable by the Inspector of Correctional Services for transporting inmates. The inspector also said that another vehicle court transport unit must be replaced as soon as possible. Two more vehicles were also being considered for replacement. The procurement of an additional vehicle followed inappropriate practices and WorkSafe ACT had to issue a prohibition notice for it. Minister, what does it say about yours and your predecessor's performance that as of November 2020, all CTU vehicles were either being assessed for replacement, being replaced under a workforce prohibition, deemed unsuitable or had a serious design flaw? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The 2020 Court Transport Unit review focused on the Court Transport Unit's fleet of vehicles. Uh, following that review, ACT Corrective Services has implemented, updated and improved procurement procedures for contra uh, court transport vehicles. And the CTU report did make a comment that the Camrys were unsuitable, largely due to their size, for the transport of detainees. It did not, however, make a formal recommendation in relation to the safety of the Camrys and did not uh, review AMC transport vehicles. Supplementary, Mrs Jones. Mr. Does it take a formal recommendation for common sense to prevail on how many Camrys were being used by the CTU? What will happen to them now that they are no longer being used? Mr Gentleman, do you need the question repeated, well, Mr thank Gentleman? Well, you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, you know, I don't approve the use of the vehicles. They're done uh, particularly by um, corrections operational procedures. Uh, so I don't think it comes down to myself to allocate them what vehicles they should use. Uh, of course, uh, Camrys are an ANCAP 
five rated vehicle quite safe on ACT roads. Uh, and they have, of course, of, of course been the subject of human rights uh, uh, recommendations, Madam Speaker, for the way that detainees should be transported, uh, particularly in these circumstances, to medical facilities. Mrs Kicker. Thank you, Minister. How much does the government pay SG Fleet to lease each individual CTU vehicle? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have to take the question without detail on notice. Questions without notice. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Mental Health. Minister, I was delighted last week to see that Headspace has opened up a brand new facility in my electorate of Brindabella. Can you please update the Assembly on what you're doing and the ACT Government is doing to support the mental health and wellbeing, particularly of young people in Tuggeranong? Mr. Da Mrs. Davidson. Uh, I thank Mr. Davis for the question. Uh, Headspace Tuggeranong will be an important addition to the mental health service system in the ACT, particularly for children and young people on the south side. Uh, it's a very well integrated part of the ACT's mental health sector. It offers an important step for children and young people who are experiencing mild to moderate mental health concerns. Uh, schools in Tuggeranong can also offer the Black Dog Institute's Youth Aware of Mental Health program. This is a free program that's offered to Year 9 students and gives them a, a toolkit of uh, things that, and skills that they can use to look after their mental health and wellbeing and to look out for signs of mental illness or distress in themselves or their peers. And I note that there's been now more than 3,000 uh, young people in Year 9 who have participated in that Youth Aware of Mental Health program, which means that more than half of the uh, 15, 16 year olds in the ACT will have had access to that program. So that means that either they or someone in their social network will have been given those skills um, and uh, will be able to look out for mental health in their peers. Supplementary, Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, earlier in estimates, I heard about the youth navigation portal that your office is leading. Can you explain in more detail what that portal will do and advise when it will start? Ms Davidson. Yes, uh, the youth navigation portal uh, is a very important tool to help young people in finding and accessing the right services and supports for their needs at the time. Uh, where it's up to at the moment following a procurement uh, request for a quote process, Mary Mead has been selected as the community organisation to lead and manage the portal. Uh, and the Office for Mental Health and Wellbeing and Mary Mead are working closely to continue stakeholder engagement and consultation with children and young people and parents and carers and with service providers. Uh, in early July of 2021, Capgemini was selected to build the IT component of the portal, uh, and that was through a separate request for, quote, procurement process, uh, and the design process is currently underway. Um, it will have an iterative release, and the first release will be in late September of 2021. Mrs Jones. Oh, thank you, Minister. How much of Headspace Tuggeron is funded by the ACT government and how much is fed, funded by the federal Liberal government? Ms Davidson. Uh, Headspace in Tuggeranong is a Commonwealth program. Uh, it fits into a broad and diverse range of mental health services within the ACT and we're very happy to have it here. Questions without notice. Mr Hanson. Uh, Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Corrections. Minister, on the 20th of July this year, Canberra found out that a detainee had been mistakenly re released from jail before completing his sentence. This detainee is a repeat offender who had already been denied bail. After being told to hand himself in, he said that he would try, but ultimately, close to a week later, a warrant had to be issued for his arrest when he failed to turn himself in. You blamed human error caused by a database that requires manual checks across multiple files. This database system dates back to 1985, and the Inspector of Corrections said it was probably antiquated when the government bought it. Minister, for how long was this detainee at large under your watch? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank Mr Hanson for the question. The accidental release was due to human error. Uh, detainees can often be sentenced for a charge while also being on remand before either the Magistrates' Court and or the Supreme Court and the current release processes require manual checks of documents to occur. Due to the human error in this case, information in relation to this detainee's remand was missed. Unfortunately, sometimes this does happen. Uh, none of us are perfect, Madam Speaker, and we all make mistakes, uh, but we do learn from Madam Speaker, and uh, we will... 
Mrs Jones, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We do learn for it and, of course, we will uh, uh, review this situation and put in place practices that will make it safer for detainees in the Canberra public. Mr Hanson. Minister, why do you stand by your decision to blame ACT correction staff, given the database they were forced to use is described as antiquated? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that was the advice uh, provided to me uh, by the briefing from our corrections uh, chief officer. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, I was wondering if you could outline how uh, you're working with correction officers to review these incidents. Mr. Gentleman. Mr. Patterson, for the question, uh, there are, have been a number of reviews uh, of particular cases and the AMC over many years, Madam Speaker, many recommendations which the government has agreed to. And we're working through those recommendations through the Blueprint for Change program uh, and the, uh, of course, committee that's in place headed by Ms Nixon, Madam Speaker, who has a vast uh, background in corrections and other policing matters. Uh, she's already put it back to me uh, that she's pleased with the results so far and the input, particularly from corrections officers, and feels that it is going well. Uh, so I look forward uh, to the rest of the recommendations from the committee, the implementation uh, of those uh, for better opportunities for our staff into the future and conditions for detainees at the AMC. Questions without notice? Ms Orr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport and City Services. Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the expansion of the light rail network to Woden? Mr Steele. I thank uh, Ms Orr for our question and, and our interest in light rail and the benefits it will provide in expanding to Woden for Gungahlin residents as well as for the rest of the city. Certainly it comes at an interesting time for the light rail project. It is our city's biggest ever infrastructure build. And I'm pleased to advise the Assembly that key preparatory works are already underway. The first physical works on the project are planned to start before the end of this month. We have commenced work to translocate the Golden Sun Moth population from the northern part of the median on Commonwealth Avenue. And we recognise that protecting Canberra's environment and heritage throughout this project is essential. Early works to relocate utilities will commence shortly. This will involve moving critical water and communication utility assets from their current position along the southern section of London Circuit to a new alignment via Edinburgh Avenue, Vernon Circle and Constitution Avenue. This will pave the way for London Circuit to be raised to an at-grade intersection with Commonwealth Avenue. Major works on this part of the project will commence in the first half of next year. Delivering light rail to Wodham will create over 6,000 jobs. It will give Canberrans on the south side more convenient and reliable transport options, help prevent future traffic gridlock and cut transport emissions for a cleaner environment. Stage two of light rail will ensure that Canberra grows to be a more vibrant, sustainable and connected city. And it's important that we get on with delivering this future focused investment now, as we deliver a better public transport system before our city experiences the same traffic problems that other cities face. Supplementary. Madam Speaker. Minister, what is the ACT government doing about the disruption associated with the project? Mr Still. Thank you, Ms Orr, for her supplementary. The ACT government is being upfront with the community that the construction of light rail will be disruptive for Canberra's road network while we build a more vibrant, sustainable and connected city. Because of this project and parallel work that's being undertaken by the National Capital Authority, lane closures and diversions will need to be in place on Commonwealth Avenue for an extended period of years. This will see more traffic dispersed onto routes like Kings Avenue and Parks Way. The construction will mainly impact those coming from the south side into the city, but there will be flow members. on impacts for the rest of the road traffic network. I want to assure members in this place and all Canberrans that we are putting in place significant preparation and planning to minimise this disruption. We don't want to see Canberrans stuck in their cars in daily gridlock, and that's why we've formed a disruption task force that brings together expertise in road and tr public transport network planning, behaviour change, communications and community engagement. Right now, the Disruption Task Force is making plans to mitigate the construction impacts by identifying opportunities to manage network demand, provide alternative transport options and invest in new infrastructure like road network improvements on other routes. 
We'll also be communicating early and often with the community and business during the disruption to give Canberrans the information that they need to make choices about how they, how they move around our city and to help to keep other people moving as well. We'll be supporting Canberrans through this time because we understand that disruption on this scale uh, is coming and we need a clear and coordinated response led by government. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, given your warning the Canberra community about the disruption now, when will construction begin? Mr Steele. I'm really pleased to say that construction on light rail to Woden is starting this year. The first package of works involves setting up construction site compounds and undertaking utility relocation works. This work must be completed prior to raising London Circuit to reduce the risk of damage to critical utilities during the project's major construction works. There will be some local traffic impacts associated with these works, but they'll be relatively minor. While these early works are underway, we'll be preparing the major project documentation to receive approval from the NCA and undertaking procurement for a project delivery partner. The first major works to raise London Circuit will then get underway from around quarter two of next year. This will require a number of road closures as the current clover leaves and the Commonwealth Avenue overpass over London Circuit are progressively dismantled. We're encouraging the community to keep up to, to date with the project by signing up for email alerts via the Light Rail to Woden website at act.gov.au slash Light Rail to Woden. This website also has lots of maps and information on the specific routes that will be affected by construction. These will be continually updated as construction progresses and the government will be communicating clearly and early and regularly across a range of channels as the construction program gets underway. I'd like to thank the community in advance for their patience and understanding as we deliver this important infrastructure project that will benefit Canberrans for generations to come. Questions without notice? Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to uh, the Minister for Corrections. In December of 2017, Minister, a detainee was mistakenly released from the jail. Now, Mr Rattenbury said at the time that a review of the process would be conducted to ensure that this error did not reoccur. In July 2021, Canberra found out that yet another detainee was mistakenly released from the jail before completing his sentence. The government again said that a review of this incident would be undertaken to ensure that it would not happen again. Minister, what policies and procedures changed following the review in 2017, given that clearly the changes have not been sufficient? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Parton for the question. I will refer him, of course, to the previous answer uh, of the question of a similar vein. Of course, the uh, two instances were separate uh, and of different circumstances, Madam Speaker. As I said, we will, of course, have a look at this review uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, ensure that... Point of order. Uh, Resume your seat, point of order. Speaker, on relevance, the question asked what changed last time. The Minister has not actually answered that at all. I ask you to bring him to the question, which is what has changed since that first incident? Yes, there's no point of order. He took the point of order 20 seconds in. He still has plenty of times to answer. He's made reference that the review is in place and there were different circumstances. Minister, you can continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Of course, uh, over the years, we have had a number of incidents at AMC uh, and many of the recommendations occurring from those incidents have been about uh, the way we operate with uh, our staff and the uh, opportunity to increase their training across the ACT. I can say uh, since November 2020, significant strides have been made in increasing mandatory training compliance for custodial officers within ACT. On relevance, the Minister is now going to broad-based training, but we're asking about systemic changes that were made to ensure that a release wouldn't happen again. He has not mentioned that at all yet in his answer. I believe he's on topic and there is no point of order, Minister. You have 30-odd seconds to continue, if you wish. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm not sure about the opposition, but we certainly believe that training is an important part of how custodial officers can operate within the AMC to ensure safety for the future, and these releases don't occur. Uh, since that date, as I mentioned, uh, between January and April 21, the proportion of staff who have grown up, uh, of course, now up to date with mandatory training has approved. Breathing apparatus uh, training compliance has increased from 38% to 
On relevance, what does mandatory breathing apparatus training have to do with releasing detainees and the processes involved? Time has expired, Mrs Jones. You have a supplementary, Mr Parker. Yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why is the database that was being used in 2017 the same database that's being used in July 2021? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As we've said, uh, a review of this incident is being take, uh, undertaken and uh, any identified deficits within these processes will be rectified at the earliest opportunity. And so uh, when we look at the uh, specific issues around databases, there are specific sets of technology that are uh, drawn up, if you like, for correctional services across Australia. Uh, this particular one uh, is quite uh, resource intensive and we are reviewing it. We're looking to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Mr Hanson. Minister, given the review done in 2017 that didn't prevent the mistaken early release of detainees, what reasons do Canberrans have to believe that a review of the incident in July will actually change anything? Mr. Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'll refer uh, the member to my previous answer in that we have, of course, when there's been reviews, instigate, inst instigated changes uh, in performance, Madam Speaker, instigated changes in operational arrangements at AMC uh, to ensure that uh, the to ensure that staff are safe into the future and detainees are well uh, remanded. Questions without notice, Mr Milligan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Corrections. On the 12th of May this year, there was yet another riot and fire at the AMC. The fire resulted in an accommodation unit being taken offline. An officer's station was burnt and detainees had to be relocated. As of the 18th of June, the accommodation unit was still unable to house detainees. Minister, how much longer will this accommodation unit be unusable? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It will be some time. Uh, it takes quite a bit of work to uh, engage in corruption staff and, of course, repairs at the AMC due to its particular nature being a secure installation. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the area is safe for those workers and safe for detainees. Uh, so we do move detainees around the AMC uh, to ensure that repairers can get in uh, and do those operations. Uh, and I don't have a final timeline on that repair. Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what is the estimated cost to Canberra taxpayers for the damages uh, that occurred to that accommodation unit? Mr Gentleman. I'll take that on notice, Madam Speaker. Supplementary, Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, what is the total estimated cost of this right so far for Canberra's taxpayers, including damage assessments, contracted engineers reports and operational costs? Mr Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, there's quite a bit of detail in that question. I will take it on notice and come back to the Chamber. Thank you. Questions without notice? Mrs Kickett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to Minister for Corrections. Minister, following the AMC riot on the 10th of November 2020, another serious fire was lit on the 14th of November, causing the loss of 28 beds. All four corrections officers who responded to the fire had out-of-date training. Two had their fire training cancelled a few months earlier. One officer recalled that the fire was so hot that it was melting their boots. After an incident like this, a formal debrief must occur, but no such debrief happened. These serious WorkSafe failings contributed to the Inspector of Corrections issuing several recommendations after his review of the incident. Minister, why are you risking the lives of officers by requiring them to fight fires without up-to-date training? Mr. Gentleman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'll refer Ms Kickett to my previous answer on training, where the opposition said it wasn't important, but it is, as we've just heard from Mrs Kickett, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I mentioned in my previous answer the detailed levels of uh, operational training that is occurring uh, with the uh, aspects of fire, with aspects of breathing apparatus and safety training for those detainees. 
Supplementary, Mrs. Kickett. Minister, have you provided AMC staff with protective heavy duty equipment for protection against heat, fire, and chemicals as per recommendation one from the inspector's report? Mr. General. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand that's still being uh, worked on with AMC staff and the Why? Commissioner. So uh, I'll be able to come back to the chamber with the number of PPE equipment that's been uh, circulated so far uh, in detail. Mr Kane. Uh, Minister, why was there no formal debrief for officers after the incident, given this is a requirement of the Incident Reporting Notifications and Debrief Policy 2020 to ensure lessons are learned from incidents such as these? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that's a matter I'll have to take up with AMC. I haven't been briefed on whether there was a debrief uh, or not. Um, but, of course, if it's a recommendation or a condition of the Code of Operation at AMC, it certainly should occur. I've had recent, uh, of course, conversations with a number of staff at AMC and, of course, the union and their delegates as well, uh, who would like to see some changes in the way we operate the AMC, and we'll certainly take those on board. Questions without notice, Dr. Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the ACT's vaccination rollout? Ms. Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr. Patterson for the question. And I am, of course, pleased to inform the Assembly that the ACT's COVID-19 vaccination program is continuing to progress both efficiently and safely. Since our program began on the 22nd of February this year, a total of 142,779 vaccine doses have been administered through ACT government clinics. And of course, that is uh, complemented by the rollout through primary care and the direct rollout into residential aged care as well that the Commonwealth is responsible for. This is an incredible achievement to date and combined with the Commonwealth Government's expansion of the role of primary care in administering vaccines, more than half of the ACT's adult population has now received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. On the 29th of June, the ACT's third COVID-19 vaccination clinic commenced operations at the Canberra Airport precinct. Our health services have been administering COVID-19 vaccines seven days a week and we're increasing our vaccination capacity so that more Canberrans can get vaccinated. Recently, the capacity of ACT vaccination clinics was increased to more than 14,000 Pfizer doses a week. This is more than double our previous capacity. We've reserved 2,000 appointments each week for important high-risk groups, including healthcare, disability and aged care workers. The ACT government recognises that these workers are essential to our community and that it is vital they have the ability to get vaccinated as soon as possible. We're expecting to receive an increasing supply of COVID-19 vaccines in coming months from the Commonwealth. This will support the ACT to open even more appointments and continue to expand eligibility. Getting vaccinated provides protection to recipients of the vaccine and helps reduce the risk of COVID-19 to vulnerable patients and residents and the wider community. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how is the Territory increasing the number of people who can access the vaccination? Ms Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for the supplementary. Well, as members may be aware, on Saturday the 17th of July, the Chief Minister announced that from Wednesday the 21st, 30 to 39-year-old Canberrans were able to register through the digital health record consumer portal, MyDHR, the ACT government's online booking system for COVID-19 vaccinations. More than 20,000 30 to 39-year-olds took up the opportunity to register their interest. This is another excellent indication that Canberrans are ready and willing to get vaccinated to protect themselves and their loved ones. This call to registration was possible due to the excellent organisation and preparation of our public health officials. This morning, those 20,000 30 to 39 year olds received a text message to tell them they could now book their COVID-19 vaccination. The opening of eligibility for COVID-19 vaccination appointments to 30 to 39 year olds is an exciting development for the ACT government COVID-19 vaccination programs. Of the 70,000 30 to 39 year olds in the ACT, 16,000 have already received their first COVID-19 vaccination dose as part of phases 1A and 1B, or at least their first dose. We are now, now we're encouraging the remaining 54,000 30 to 39 year olds to roll up their sleeves to protect themselves, their families and their community. 
Madam Speaker, vaccines are the only way out of this pandemic. There is no other viable alternative to protect yourself and the people around you from very serious illness as a result of COVID-19. I encourage all eligible Canberrans to receive a vaccination. Supplementary, Dr. Um, sorry, Mr. Patterson. <laughs> Mr. Thank Patterson. You. Close enough, I have, Speaker. Yes, we all know. <laughs> Minister, how is the ACT planning for the expected increase in vaccines in the final quarter of the year? Ms. Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Pedersen for the supplementary. The ACT Government is continuing to plan for the anticipated increase in supply of COVID-19 vaccines from the Commonwealth. This increased supply will place us in a position to increase our vaccination appointments to more eligible Canberrans. A recent successful change in the patient model of care in ACT Government clinics has significantly increased throughput and resulted in more Canberrans having access to a COVID-19 vaccine. In the last fortnight, the Essential Access and Sensory Clinic, which has, has almost also doubled its weekly appointments. This is in response to excellent community uptake and stakeholder feedback. More planning is underway to review current clinic models and prepare for future expansion of ACT government vaccination clinics. This will enable us to be ready for the expected increase in COVID-19 vaccine supply in coming months. Further planning and policy efforts are also focused on improving equity and access to COVID-19 vaccination within high-risk groups, such as, as I previously mentioned, aged care and disability residential care workers. Getting vaccinated provides protection to these recipients of the vaccine and also helps to reduce the risk to vulnerable people. The ACT government is also committed to ensuring equity of access to COVID-19 vaccines to those Canberrans who are less likely to engage with health services. This includes homeless and housing insecure populations, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, people living with drug and alcohol dependencies and mental health challenges, and in congregate living arrangements, including secure facilities, supported accommodation and refuges. And I'm speaking, Canberrans can be confident that the ACT government will continue to deliver a safe and effective vaccination rollout in partnership with the Commonwealth's primary care and pharmacies. Thank you to all the health professionals who are part of this incredible effort. Questions without notice, Ms Clay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Transport, Canberra and City Services. Minister, I've been speaking to many West Belconnen residents who are concerned about the active travel connections between West Belconnen, the town centre and the rest of the city. I have some concerns about the William Hovell Drive duplication, but I'm pleased to see that dedicated bike lanes are included, as well as an off-road shared path. But on similar trunk roads, we've seen quite high rates of accidents for people riding bikes. Can you please advise what infrastructure will be used to separate bikes from cars in the on-road cycle lanes? Mr Steele. I thank uh, Ms Clay for her question and note her interest in active travel. The ACT government is investing in our road network, including through the duplication of William Hovell Drive, which will be a key uh, road that will service the growing region of Gin and Derry, but also uh, Malongolo as well. As part of that duplication work, the ACT government uh, is taking the opportunity to establish a new off-road shared path connection between uh, West Belconnen, Malongolo and the rest of our shared path network. This seven kilometre active travel uh, route will run from Drake Brockman Drive uh, through to uh, Bindubi Street and will actually go beyond the uh, section where the duplication will be occurring uh, in order to link it through to the rest of our shared path network, which is will be an entirely off-road uh, ride um, from those regions, which will help to improve safety and provide another option for people who are looking to take that route, particularly commuting into the city on a bike. And we're hoping that'll encourage more people to take it up. Of course, the other uh, central links, um, which have been identified in our transport strategy uh, which go through uh, Belconnen and which are our, trans our public transport uh, links are also important and we're continuing to uh, invest in those uh, as well. Off-road uh, off shared paths aren't the only part of uh, this connection, of course, on-road shared paths are a feature of, our, of all of our road upgrades as well, but we want to provide the opportunity and option for people to go uh, off-road where they can. Of course, under the transport strategy as well, we've committed to undertake uh, further work and consultation with the community uh, on standards for active travel along mid-block sections as well as uh, key intersections. And we're looking at how we can improve safety uh, in the design of those feature features that goes beyond Australian standards. Supplementary, Supplementary. Ms Clay. Uh, Minister, what infrastructure will be included to protect bike riders when they're crossing the roads? 
Mr Steele. I think the member for her question and uh, with the off-road cycle lanes, we'll be utilising many of the underpasses that already exist uh, on uh, William Hobble Drive so that people can safely pass from one side of the road uh, to the other in, in certain sections, uh, and as well as connecting with the Bicentennial Trail, the equestrian links, uh, as well as the rest of the shared path network. So there should be no reason to have to cross the road. And of course, further up the network, the road network, uh, there may be intersections that are established and those will have safe crossing points for pedestrians. Supplementary, Mrs Kickett. Uh, Minister, when will construction happen of the duplication of William Harville Drive? Following Mr. detailed design, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Questions without notice. <laughs> Ms. Castle, oh members, your colleague, Madam Speaker. Yep, yep. My question is to the Minister for Corrections. Minister, between October 2020 and April 2021, 208 strip searches were carried out on women at the AMC. Almost 60% of them were conducted on Indigenous women. The data released via FOI also revealed that women at the AMC are strip searched at a rate of roughly 30 a month. The population of women at the AMC is about 20. Julie Tongs and Atkos have both pointed to this data as evidence that a commission of inquiry into systemic racism in the entire ACT justice system is needed. Your government has repeatedly dismissed any such inquiry. Minister, does this data on disproportionate strip searches of Indigenous women constitute evidence of systemic racism in the ACT justice system? Mr. Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Springer. I thank Ms. Castley for the question. And, and I will say that the government has not rejected that uh, claim. And in fact, uh, we are leading uh, a response in the justice sense of the amount of uh, Indigenous overrepresentation uh, within our whole justice system, Madam Speaker. The Attorney General uh, is leading that work. And indeed, uh, as a government, we're responding, of course, uh, to the inquiry for. Um, uh, Ms Tongs and the roundtable recommendations, uh, Madam Speaker, so uh, I'm pleased that that work is starting. I, I do recognise the negative impact that searches can have on detain detainees and that this is especially so for women. Uh, women offenders often have higher levels of complex trauma, family and sexual violence and a disadvantaged backgrounds. And as a government, we're committed to providing appropriate supports to female detainees at the AMC. However, searches need to take place uh, at time to ensure the safety and security of staff and detainees at the prison. ACT Corrective Services is currently procuring a body scanner, uh, which will mean that in future, the number of strip searches of detainees will be minimised greatly. Uh, this is good news and will be welcomed by detainees and staff alike, as searches can be uncomfortable for all parties involved. Ms Gastley. Minister, why is there an unacceptably high level of strip searches that occurred under your watch, and even worse, the close to 50 a month that occurred under Minister, Mr Rattenbury? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, between October 2019 and 30 June 21, these are the stats I have, 51% uh, of searches on female detainees were of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, female detainees. 49% of the searches were non-Aboriginal uh, Islander uh, and Islander female detainees. Uh, these searches resulted in uh, 12 detections of contraband, eight on Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander females and four on non-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander females. Uh, in terms of population on 30 June 21, uh, there were 21 female detainees at AMC. Uh, Madam Speaker, of course, searches are used in correctional facilities uh, right across the world uh, to ensure the safety of staff and detainees. If uh, searches occur at a rate, uh, and it's particularly when they're moving, so for example, uh, if detainees are going to a court appearance, then they will be uh, searched before and sometimes after the court appearance too, to ensure there are no um, uh, foreign uh, parts on their body, Madam Speaker, as I said, for the safety of all concerned. Dr Patterson. Madam Speaker. Minister, I was wondering if you could further outline how the government is committed to ensuring safe conditions for female detainees. Mr Gentleman. Yes, Madam Speaker. Um, as you heard from uh, the Minister for Women, as Barry, this morning, we're working as best we can to support uh, women detainees in the AMC, whether it's not their personal 
uh, situations with searches or whether it's their situation for accommodation within AMC. Uh, we have moved women back to uh, the uh, proposed built women's facility at AMC and the recent visit I had with Minister Barry uh, gave us some very good feedback from those detainees about the quality of life that they are now having at the AMC. There's more work to do though, Madam Speaker. We need to provide uh, more opportunities for learning uh, amongst that cohort uh, and more opportunities for privacy as well. Questions without notice, Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Corrections. Minister, in a roundtable with you and other ministers, Aboriginal leaders were asked to determine what form the investigation into Indigenous overrepresentation into the justice system should take. They unanimously requested a commission of inquiry. In response, Minister Stephen Smith and the Attorney General wrote that a commission would require significant expense and that its recommendations are quote, reasonably likely to mirror those of previous inquiries and reviews, many of which are yet to be implemented by your government. When asked about overrepresentation, the chair of the AMC Oversight Committee recently stated that one cause is, quote, the white community thinking they know what's always best. I hope we can stop thinking that the white community has the answers because we clearly don't. In your role as Minister for Corrections, have you advocated for the requested Commission of Inquiry? And if not, why not? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I've worked with my colleagues, the Attorney General, uh, Minister Rachel Stephen smith uh, and of course Emma, on the um, response to the roundtable, uh, and we're still working through that process. Uh, there'll be, uh, I think, a number of opportunities for Aboriginal people to be able to take the forum forward uh, in our responses, Madam Speaker, and of course they have called for it and the government has responded to say it should be Aboriginal-led. The question Jones. was whether he has advocated for it or not, and that was not answered in his answer. I can't direct the minister how he answers the question. He responded to the question appropriately. He didn't provide that, but he responded appropriately. Mr Cain, supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Minister, if a commission of inquiry is unlikely to reveal anything new, as your government claims, can you explain specifically why the ACT has the highest Indigenous incarceration rate in Australia and why that rate is growing faster here than in any other jurisdiction? Mr Gentleman. Well, Madam Speaker, I reject the premise of the question. We have not said we will not find anything new. Every inquiry find something new, Madam Speaker, and it, that's how we learn uh, on the actions that we should take and the resources we should put forward into over-representation, Madam Speaker. I think the work that the Attorney-General, Rachel Steve Smith, and the government is doing in response to this uh, is appropriate, and of course it will have resourcing as well. Mrs Kickett. Minister, what right does your all-white government have to ask Aboriginal leaders um, to determine the form of a review just, into over-representation? Yes. I was, I was directing from a quote. Well, you didn't present it as a quote. It was the quote. What right? Can you, if you're, if you're responding to the point of order, members, members, Mr. Rattenbury, do you want to take, do you want to stand and make your comment? I think the chief minister was taking point of order first, Madam Speaker. I'll... No, I'll speak after the chief minister. Yes. So the point of order, Madam Speaker, is it's very clear in standing orders that questions cannot contain imputations, and that is exactly what that question did. Mr. Rattenbury. Madam Speaker, I take a slightly different approach to the Chief Minister, but I think that um, starting to refer to groups in the Chamber by racial titles is actually not a slope that we want to slide down. I think it's quite disrespectful and not how we want to talk about people in the ACT in the way that uh, Mrs Kickett is seeking to represent it. I think uh, it's unhelpful and it's unedifying. Mrs Jones. Um, we are constantly being given descriptions of different people in the community by their racial attributes by the government. So if people want to make the point that was made by Christine Nixon in this place 
and refer to her intelligent assessment of what's going on in this government, then I don't understand how there can possibly be a point of order when a piece of fact that she has pointed out, that she has considered, is being stated by the Shadow Minister. Um, can you repeat the question? Because you, you've stood and you've said that this was a quote, but you've not said if this is a quote. You've just labelled white government, is what I heard, and I would agree that that is absolutely inappropriate. Minister, what right from the Oversight Committee Chair when she said the white community thinking that they know what's always best... Is that what you have to asked ask from the original beginning? To determine no, you've, the rephrased your of a review. you've rephrased your question. You've rephrased your question. No, it's out of order. You've rephrased it. <laughs> so, questions without notice. Mr. Braddock. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Multicultural Affairs. Minister, the ACT Canberra Languages Schools has written to the both of us about the impending loss of access to teaching spaces in my electorate of Yarrabee. I'd like to know what is the government doing to support the ongoing affordable access by community languages to classes in the ACT? Ms Chan. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Braddock for the question uh, and that we uh, both acknowledge uh, how valuable language is and the important role that community language schools play in ensuring that multicultural languages are maintained and promoted. Um, Madam Speaker, just some broader overview before I get to the, the detail of the question for those who might not be aware. Uh, the ACT government investment in community languages schools is over $275,000 annually, and CSD works with the association to provide annual funding grants to over 40 schools, representing 34 languages and over 2,000 students in the ACT. Uh, to the detail of the question, uh, we have recently undertaken a review into community language schools, uh, part of which is subject to a, a motion tomorrow. Uh, and I note that Mr Braddock's motion calls for the review and the response to be tabled at the end of October uh, of this year. The government is uh, currently working on a cross-directorate uh, response to the review uh, because, as uh, Mr Braddock noted, uh, community language schools operate in a range of venues, including uh, in schools. We are aware um, that there are some concerns about the current use of facilities, uh, including with schools and CSD, uh, in addition to responding to the report. Uh, it's also um, working with the ACT Education Directorate on the current issues uh, that have been raised uh, with me and with Mr Braddock. Uh, of course, the ACT government supports the community use of public school facilities, um, but we need to ensure that uh, there is a real balance there um, with the community use as well as uh, the, the important school operations and that public schools are community hubs and their facilities enrich the lives of all local residents uh, not just those who attend the school. Supplementary, Mr Braddock. Thank you. I would just, while it's thankful for the support that the ACT government provides to community languages, I would just question in terms of how the provision of grants to do community languages is then returned to the government in the form of higher fees for community-owned spaces. Is that a business model that's going to continue? I will give you before. Can I just remind members that the second supplementary is direct with no preamble? I gave you some grace there, Mr Braddock, but not next time. To the answer, Ms Chain. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. This was uh, subject uh, to the review and the tabling of the review and the response to the review will address that. Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, will the multi-purpose community centre that's planned for Gungahlin include spaces for community groups to book for classes? Ms Chain. That's a question for the Chief Minister. <laughs> Mr Barr, you're responding to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As the uh, project is developed, there will be an opportunity for community engagement in relation to the internal spaces and configuration within the new centre, uh, so that is quite likely, Mr Davis, that that particular use would be able to be accommodated within the new centre. Thank you, members.
questions without notice. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Rights. Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the action taken following the motion passed on 31 March in relation to territory rights? Ms Chang. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, restoring territory rights is about our democratic rights. It's about giving citizens in the ACT and the Northern Territory the same rights as those who live in the states. Since the ACT Legislative Assembly unanimously passed the motion on 31 March, I've continued to pre pre press the case. It is the last question, Madam Speaker. Come on. Um, Not members, to you, to Mr. Yeah. Nelson. Me members, members. <laughs> Ms. Chang. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've continued to press the case and momentum is building. Last month, the Northern Territory Attorney General and I published an opinion piece in the Canberra Times calling on the federal government to finally show some leadership on this issue and restore our territory rights. It'd be nice if they'd respond to our letter as well. I'm pleased to see so many Canberrans supporting territory rights and the Canberra Times launching their own Our Right to Decide campaign. We've received some valuable support from across the political spectrum over the past little while. Federal Minister Simon Birmingham, for example, put his support for territory rights on the record back in 2019. And last week, Mr Rattenbury and Mrs Jones were both great panel members at the Politics in the Pub discussing territory rights. The Federal Labor representatives for the ACT have all been particularly vocal in support of territory rights. For example, Andrew Lee recently sponsored a private member's motion in Members, do not distract someone when they're on the floor. In the House of Representatives, calling on the government to repeal the law blocking the territories from legislating on voluntary assisted dying. And Senator Gallagher has also been very vocal. Resume your seat. Point of order. Oh, I actually literally can hardly hear Ms yes. Chain because of the chatter. Uh, members, if we were all silent, Ms Chain would be heard. Ms Chain. Uh, and Senator Gallagher has also been very vocal in the media. <laughs> Doctor, members, we're getting to the end, I know, but there are more questions to go. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, have you written to the responsible federal minister about territory rights? And if so, what has the response been? Ms Chan. Ms Chan. Thank you. Mr Hanson, can we have one question time where I don't call you to water? Uh, no. Yes. Miss <laughs> Miss <Ms. laughs> Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I note that uh, once upon a time, Mr Hanson actually considered this issue important. On the 3rd of March, the Northern Territory Attorney General and I jointly wrote to three responsible federal ministers drawing their attention to the human rights implications of the territories not being able to legislate on voluntary assisted dying. And we asked the ministers to take action to fix this. We wrote to the then Minister for Regional Development uh, and the, Minister, the Assistant Minister for Territories, Nola Marino, and the then Attorney General, Christian Porter. We've not received a response when there was a cabinet reshuffle, so on 23 April, the Northern Territory Attorney General and I wrote to the incoming Federal Attorney General to highlight that we'd not received a response, and we've still not received a response from any minister, and today it marks five months. All we've had is a note from the Attorney General's Department saying they've referred our correspondence to Ms Marino, but we've since heard informally that the Attorney General has decided she is the responsible minister after all. It's deeply disappointing that the federal government has been bouncing the issue among ministers when all they need to do is agree to make a simple legislative change. While ever they continue to stall, they are preventing the territories from having a meaningful conversation about our end of life choices, all while the states are able to progress voluntary assisted dying laws for themselves. Mr Davis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, what or who are the current greatest threats to securing territory rights? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, there is a, a probably a greatest hits list here, uh, but I think what is incredibly frustrating... Members, enough. Ms Chain. Madam Speaker, I think the greatest threat overall here is the conflation of voluntary assisted dying with our democratic rights and with restoring territory rights. And... Mr Hanson, that is enough. 
Ms Chair. And Madam Speaker, I implore members in the Federal Parliament to be aware of this issue, to be aware how it affects Canberrans and how it affects uh, all of the citizens of the Northern Territory, how unfair and how untenable it is that uh, our rights are different to those of, uh, who reside in the states, uh, simply because uh, something was inserted into our self-government acts uh, more than 24 years ago. It's frustrating, it's sad, uh, and there are people who are suffering as, as a result, and it's those who cannot distinguish between the two issues uh, and those who are not standing up for us, including the ACT Liberal Senator and Zed Seselja, who could be actively campaigning for territory rights, but instead is actively campaigning against Canberrans and thus abandoning them. That is so incredibly frustrating to many members here. Mr Barr. Further questions can be placed on the notice paper. Thank you, Madam. I agree. Thank you, Mr Barr. So are there matters arising from question time, members, before we move to papers? No matters arising.